Welcome to Genomics Gupshap. Genomics Gupshap is an initiative by Mac My Genome to create a community around genomics and to simplify genomics for everyone. And we do this by bringing together experts from allied areas like medicine, genetic counseling, nutrition, fitness, and more. Please join us as we spread the word about this exciting science of genomics. We are now present on your favorite podcast as well. Just search for Genomics Gupshap on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, or Google Podcast. Today, we are very excited because we're going to have a very different format of how we're going to do genomic structure. And we are very excited to have Dr. Rajiv Sharma, who heads the medical affairs at Tata 1MG. He's been involved in building several other uh, startups and has also have startups or built startups of his own in the healthcare space. Uh, welcome to the show, Dr. Rajiv. Hi, Brad. Welcome to you too. Thank you so much uh, for having us and me. Uh, on this very interesting concept of uh, Gupshup. Uh, so uh, let's start, however, whichever way you like. And, you know, I think uh, people won't know, but, um, uh, I, you know, I know Anu for a very long time. And, um, um, you know, if if there was one person who, if I, who, if I had to name from bioinformatics or uh, uh, engineer in a bioscience genomic space, it's Anu Acharya. So... Uh, welcome to you too, and uh, let's begin the conversation. I think before we uh, go ahead, Anu, we would, you know, I would really, really uh, suggest and request if you could tell us a little about yourself. Um, you know, in terms of how did your journey move from in, being an engineer to a totally bioscience person and taking a bet on something very novel and new uh, in genomic space many, many years back, and then with Map My Genome. I think almost a decade back, if I'm not wrong. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much. So I think this is a question I get asked often that, you know, you you went to IIT, you, how did you end up in, in, in genomics? And I think today IITs do have a lot of biotechnology. But when I went, which was many, many years ago, um, we didn't have that, right? But I was fascinated by physics. I was fascinated by all things, uh, you know, people like, Richard Feynman, Albert Einstein, and, and all of those uh, interesting ones, especially Oppenheimer, I think you might have seen the movie and so on, right? So we, we did all of that, but uh, I went to the US, worked for a startup, and uh, worked for another large company. And around that time, I think was a very exciting time for startups in general, right? because it was a time, this is time just before Google, um, just before Google came out. So there was not really much in terms of the search engines either. So once we got in, we were trying out a lot of different ideas. And one of the ideas that was proposed to us was, uh, can we do something in the genomics space? Uh, or not, it was not called genomics at that time. It was called bioinformatics mostly. Right? And when we searched for that on, on InfoSeq, because that was the search engine that we had at the time, um, there wasn't much information, but we just, we read that, you know, the whole genome project is just about to get completed. And this was going to, you know, essentially create this whole software for the human body, right? So, you know, coming from a background where I was helping in a lot of systems, I think for me, there was nothing more exciting than decoding our own system, really, right? Our own software. So I thought, you know, sounds great. And maybe this is something intellectually challenging enough that, we can solve as a problem. And so we moved back to India uh, with this idea without having the requisite knowledge at that point of time. But we did have a founder who also came from this background. And that's how uh, we started the journey with Osimo Biosolutions. And that was exactly 23 years ago, which means that you know there are 23 pairs of chromosomes. We now have 23 years of experience. So I think you know, it's an interesting time to be uh, having this conversation. But we started this and it was a fascinating journey because we were literally the first um, you know, company to get started in this space. Uh, there were one or two companies also that came around the same time, I think uh, you know, in 2001 and so on. But we started off, we built software, we uh, acquired three companies, mostly outside of India. We became one of the largest genomic services players. We had databases that were used for early discovery and so on. We worked with a lot of um, the, the US FDA, US EPA for some of the databases that we had. So very exciting journey, I would say. But at the same time, I really felt that there was uh, a lack of data that would push the Indian population towards personalized medicine. That was number one. 
And the second thing was, you know, when I looked at what was going on in healthcare, um, I saw that most of the time people were looking at it in terms of how do you cure something, right? How do you cure somebody who has a problem and, and so on? So I was thinking that, you know, the curve in terms of how much you spend at the early stages versus late stage is skewed towards, you know, you spend very less at early stages versus late stages, but people normally don't even bother to do that because they feel there is no outcome that is attached to it. So preventive medicine, in my view, was something that uh, would be very, very exciting. It would be something that we could actually use it for saving a lot of lives. Right? So that's how we got, you know, moved into something as exciting as uh, Map My Genome. And I think, you know, we got started uh, 10 years ago and uh, you know, created this whole category called preventive genomics uh, or consumer genomics, as it is called sometimes. But it's fascinating because it was it was a great time to get started, but it was... You know, again, like Osimum, no, uh, there wasn't enough education about this space. So we had to, you know, when you create a category, you are you are basically also tasked with the role of educating the rest of the consumers as well. So that's how we got started with uh, with Map My Genome ten years ago. Fantastic, and I think uh, you know, uh, uh, you said twenty three you know, years with 23 pairs of chromosomes. So, you know, I'm sure the next 23 years for the second half of the pair. Second half, yes. <laughs> let's let's hope hope that for genetic science and, and bioscience. Uh, so, I no, it's very interesting because um, even at Tata 1MG, we, you know, we take um, a real um, pride and uh, focus on preventive medicine because, okay. you know, till now it's all been therapeutic medicine or curative medicine. Now, we are also um, pushing and uh, trying to uh, make our users aware uh, that preventive medicine is far better, which was a concept, you know, uh, in our Vedas with Ayurveda. Um, but we are going back to probably the same. And we are also through our diagnostic tests and, um, you know, packages as well as uh, general lifestyle uh, modifications. We are also uh, professing and um, yeah, trying to teach our users that preventive medicine or preventive lifestyle is much better than, you know, going into the curative phase. And that's where the world is heading now with all, you know, vegan movements and uh, different diets, some of them fat, but, uh, but yes, uh, I think, I think we are all talking the same language and that's a good thing. Uh, I think even in terms of education, right. I think uh, I do remember like even when Tata Man, I mean, when it was 1MG before uh, the same, that the uh, you know created this whole wealth of knowledge around medicines, and I think those are things that you know not many people thought of at that point of time, right? So it is it's a great thing to see that whole evolution. I think we have all lived through this process of where we had to create something like that, but today everyone takes as granted, right? So sure, no, very very interesting. Uh, thank you. And, you know, personally, I've been very, very fascinated by genetics, even during my medicine days. And I think, um, uh, you know, and I can, you know, with, with the information, I can totally call you a nerd or a geek uh, with uh, with all Albert Einstein and, and the books that you've read. But and I'm sure a lot of other interesting books on gen genetics and uh, genomic science. But for us, um, uh, you know, we used to have biochemistry and physiology and immunology, and that would give us quite a bit of meat into, uh, you know, as deep as at, at a DNA level or a chromatin level or genetics level and, you know, a few other things. So I think um, uh, uh, what I would, you know, uh, request uh, for, for everyone to understand from you, you know, not uh, making it very biology heavy, but uh, from you, you know, you're in a consumer market space uh, from a genetic standpoint, but could you uh, explain you know, what is genetic mapping? Because you call, you know, the company is called Map My Genome. And uh, uh, what is mapping and how do you do it? I think uh, it'll really help for everyone to understand. Absolutely. So, uh, so Dr. Rajiv, so basically, I think what you're doing is you are trying to understand what is there in your DNA, right? And our DNA is basically uh, all the uh, 3.2 mm -hmm. billion base pairs, which lies inside each of our cells, right? So you have this material, which basically is like an instruction code for the cell to say, 
you know, this is what you need to do. This is how you do certain things. So it's like basically an instruction manual for our human body to basically function. Right? So when you are born, uh, you have basically just, you know, an egg and a sperm and, and it becomes a, a human being, right? And how does it do that? Basically, it, it comes with a set of instructions and that's your DNA. And the whole set of instructions or the whole DNA that is there in that, that whole thing is called a genome, right? Now, earlier you could, like as, as most doctors would have read a lot of different parts of a human body, how it functions and all of that. But I think what we are doing in genomics is basically saying, can we now read those instructions itself, right? So if you read the instructions, there are different types of instruction that you get. One is your base level code. And by base level code means that what you inherited from your mom and dad uh, and you don't necessarily get exactly your mom and dad, but you get a combination of some of the data that your that your mom or your dad gave you in approximately, let's assume, 50-50, right, or whatever. You're getting that uh, DNA code. And that's why, you know, all your siblings look somewhat alike. They have some behavioral similarities and, and a lot of those things. So basically, you're taking that information and you read it like you would read a, a book. You read it in A to Z. We read in A, T, G, and C. That is your letter of your DNA, right? So that's essentially what we've been reading. Uh, and A, T, G, and C are basically these uh, base pairs uh, that, that are there. And I'm sure everybody now knows about A, T, G, C, thanks to COVID, I think. Uh, we read about RNA and we are basically reading DNA, right? So basically you get this set of instructions and we are reading this out either as the whole thing and the whole DNA instruction would be about 3.2 billion base pairs, or you read parts of that, right? So uh, when you are uh, when you are reading for a particular test that you do, for instance, uh, like an RT-PCR test or something like that, typically you are looking at a specific part of the of that genome, right? In in the case of COVID, people looked at that specific part to understand if it was COVID or not. Similarly, I think when you look at it from a human body's perspective. There are certain genes that are there which gives you part, uh, like there are about 20, 25, 21,000 genes that are there in your human body that tell that what needs to be done and so on. So what we would do is you will map this entire sequence out. You find out which are the parts that are uh, genes, not genes, and so on. So there are parts that are what we call as functional that converts into a, a protein or something that is required by the human body. And there are other parts that do a lot of other functions, whether it's regulating the body or otherwise, right? Now, all that might be maybe a bit, let's say, too much, but basically you have to assume that if you take information that is coming from your genome, that based on which chromosome it is, we talked about the 23 pairs of chromosomes. So based on which pair of chromosomes, where, where which chromosome it is, which location it is, it has a certain job to do, right? So what we would do is we'd pick these specific parts of the genome and the ones that are contributing to either how you look uh, or contributing to why you behave the way you behave or why is it that some people might be predisposed to a particular disease because your biological pathways get altered because of that. That understanding of what that sequence is helps us to be able to give a lot of information about a consumer, about a person. And people often think, okay, fine, are you going to tell me about a lot of the diseases that I'm going to get? That's not necessarily the only thing that you can get out of you know, mapping a genome. So when you map a genome, you can get fascinating things. So let's just take the part that you got from your parents and that doesn't change, right? So whatever you got, your, your cells keep uh, duplicating, replicating, and you still continue with that same information. So you take all that information and that information we would then create as a report that's easy for a consumer to understand. And so when we first, for instance, when we created Genome Patri, which was our first product, we basically help people understand you know, certain kinds of nutritional needs that they may have. You might have noticed that you know some people are more likely to have a deficiency than, than the others. Uh, or you can understand if there's certain behavioral uh, things, patterns that are there in, in individuals. Or you can even look at things like you know, cholesterol and others that people will, might have a higher propensity towards or not. And then, of course, there are disease risk, 
there are things like you understand uh, whether a med medicine will work for you or not. Right? Um, now for, for uh, this is one kind of set of information that you can get, but there is more things that you can get from mapping your genome. And the one area that maybe is fascinating for a lot of people is where did you come from? Right? Uh, you know, we all know that we've evolved from whether you want to believe from Adam and Eve or whether you want to believe we came from Africa or, or otherwise, which is where the evidence points towards. I think we basically see that humans have evolved over many, many years. We can sort of, you know, also see that. So there are many aspects of what you can do with genomic information. Um, this is one of them. Then there are parts of your genome that change. For instance, what we call as, you know, in, a, in the case of cancer, for instance, your, your um, you know, a lot of changes happen. So we call those as the bodily changes. And that is another thing that you can do with genomics. Uh, and there is, of course, there's much more that has happened now with the microbiome and the epigenome, but those are different parts of of uh, understanding genetics uh, or genome. I'm sorry to give a long-winded answer, but I think, you know, essentially, I think if I break it down, you are basically, like you read a book, we are reading the whole genome. We are, uh, think about it as chapters being chromosomes, your genes being your paragraphs, and your particular parts of where it is are where you would highlight them, right? Like when you're reading a book, you highlight certain things. You consider those as your markers, and that's what we would we would read either the whole thing or parts of that gene. Fantastic! That's that's like uh, uh, genomics one hundred and one. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I and you know I think the first time I heard about genome patri or gene patri, right? It, it's such a nice term that you've coined. Uh, it's almost like marketing brilliance, uh, if you ask me, uh, you know, because we always, you know, everybody knows about Janam Patri, and then you suddenly come out with uh, Gene Patri, Genome Patri, and that's, it's it's very fascinating. How how, how did you come about, uh, you know, the, the term? So interestingly, so I was uh, reading this whole, there was a book I was reading, actually, it was a book on finance. Right? So, and I was on a beach, I was reading it, and, and I kept thinking about, you know, just risk management and, and all of that. And suddenly I said, you know, all this is great, right? We, we know what to do technically with it. Like we know how to analyze this data, but how do you tell consumers when they don't even know something like this exists? Right? Uh, so is there something that you can see a parallel with? And, and I think the one thing that I saw a parallel with was, you know, there is a Janampatri and, and I do have like I'm an Acharya, so there is obviously a lot of people who are involved in uh, some of these activities in my family. And so I was familiar with uh, Janam Patri. My dad who was a physics professor, also dabbled with, uh, you know, doing something in astrology and all of that. So in some ways, um, I was exposed to those uh, terms, right? Even though my Janam Patri, I don't even know was ever made. Right. But that's a different thing. But I was exposed to the fact that there was uh, this concept and people believed in looking at it for understanding their health, understanding, you know, who you should get married to and understanding, you know, a certain uh, kinds of activities, which essentially was what we were doing in a genome party. Right. So I, you know, suddenly that idea struck me that, you know, people already know what a genome party is. And a genome patri basically is a scientific way of helping you understand, you know, whether uh, what kind of foods you should eat, what kinds of you know diseases you might, how your health is going to turn out, as well as understanding, uh, you know, understanding which kind of partner is likely to be uh, good for you based on your career status. Right? So it was not so much based on looking at stars, but looking at your own DNA code that we could help understand. So that's how it came to me. It came in a flash, of course. My co-founder was not that excited about the name Genome Patri because he felt it was too flimsy and not very scientific sounding. But I think it was, um, I think ultimately, I think it was great. A lot of people got it uh, because, you know, in the course of education, it's not just scientists that are involved. I think we have to think that when we are talking about healthcare to an average consumer or an average journalist, I think or somebody else, uh, I think you need to make sure that it's something that they are familiar with rather than 
uh, you know, tell about all the gene names and and then how brilliantly we created this polygenic risk scores and, and all of that. I think it was more important to say that something like this is available and it's available for any consumer and that it could come to their homes. Right? So that was more more uh, thought process in my brain at that point of time. Nice, nice, very nice. Uh, super interesting. Um, just one question to follow up, you know, I think what you ri rightly said that we can, to a certain extent, read and, uh, you know, predict few scores on, you know, what could be the risk related to uh, certain type of diseases and, um, you know, what medicines could work for you or uh, even, you know, uh, what's your, I remember you talking about uh, a cosmetic uh, related beauty score of sorts and, uh, also, you know, a few other uh, uh, scores. So how how accurate are these? You know, because I assume, you know, when you're reading, we are basically, uh, what we're doing is we are um, uh, statistically trying to uh, read these and match these with the exact, uh, you know, uh, diseases that are, or the effects on body uh, of few people, right? And when I say few, few million people. Uh, so, um, how accurate is this? And then secondly, especially from an Indian diaspora point of view, how accurate is this? Because most of the data, you know, the even the uh, human genome project that, uh, you know, I think it just completed or it's still ongoing. Now, um, even that uh, was more on American population and, you know, a few other, you know, Hispanics or whoever is there in the US. But how good and effective is it for Indian population? So I think these are two questions that, you know, I've always thought of. And now that I have you, I'll ask you. Sure, no, absolutely. So I think there are two parts of it, right? Like when you look at it from an accuracy perspective, one is, are you reading it right? Right? Like when you are reading something on your genome, do you get the right information, right? I, it, am I making sure that the A is an A and a T is a T and a G is a G, right? So that is one part. And there we have 99.9% .9 accuracy. So that's not a problem. The second part is that, you know, when you look at the whole wide world of genetics, there is either something that is, they are varying scores of how they contribute to a disease or a condition and so on. Um, so when you look at something which is um, a disease like diabetes or, or hypertension or something, or, or any of those things, there are many genes that may be involved in, in that. And uh, it's not that it is a single gene and that single gene is causing a problem, right? And those, we also have those as well. We call those as a carrier status where you have it and, and the other partner has it and so on. So the way we are uh, looking at it is saying that, you know, when you are looking at a polygenic risk score, which is basically saying that a disease that is probably a lifestyle related disease has multiple genes that might be affecting the outcome for the patient based on not just the genes, but also lifestyle. There are two parts that you want to make sure. One is, did you get the, uh, the, the, the markers that are there, which are accurate? And the second is that your outcome is not going to be only dependent on the markers, right? So for instance, I might have a risk for type two, di uh, type two diabetes, but Genetics is only about 25, 23 to 26% of what your outcome is. The rest of it is all what you're eating, what you're, you know, how you are, you know, exercising and so on. And so when you're looking at a polygenic risk score, you have to take both of those into account, right? So therefore, it's not that we are telling, you know, like if you do in a blood test, you know, if your HbA1c is an 8, you are clearly diabetic, right? But in this case, you're saying that maybe you're two times at risk of diabetes, which means that if you had the same, you know, two people, AK, like, you know, thoda, they are uh, doing the right kind of things, the other person is not doing the right kind of things. The chances of if you have that genetic variant is that you will probably get to that, that finish line faster, right? Like you will get to diabetes sooner. Uh, so that's the thing that we are helping people understand. The same thing is, Let's say if you take something like, um, you know, data like an ACTN3, and this is something I often have a discussion with, with my kids on, because ACTN3 basically tells whether you have a, a fast twitch muscle or an endurance kind of thing, or you are somewhere in between. Now I have the fast twitch muscle, which means that if I had trained well, which I have not, <laughs> 
I could potentially run faster than most people that probably will be with me if we train the same way. And that's something people forget. That if you train the same way, if you ate the same things, then the chances of you doing better are higher. Right? And so that's the sort of thing that we have people understand that the accuracy is, it's not about a diagnosis. It's more about giving you that information so you can do something about it. Right? So it is about saying that you have this, if you want to make the best use of it, you should probably do A, B, and C. Right? And, and that's what you do in a, what we call as uh, uh, any outcome that has multiple genes or, or multiple markers that are there. The other uh, thing is you also asked Indian data hacking, right? Like, I mean, um, the truth is that 10 years ago, there was very little. Today, we have a lot more and we have our own data as well. Right? So 10 years ago, we started. At that time, it was hard. But one of the things we always do is we are not just giving people ki ye, ye lo, you know, 100 pages, they lo, figure out. If you're at risk, you figure it out yourself, right? We are helping people understand ki if you are at risk, what should you do for it, right? Which means that people have to give in information about their family history and what they're doing and so on. So what we call as, in, in our language, we call as like, you know, phenotype and then you have the genotype. Right? So you, we are taking both those information. And today I think we have enough information for most of these conditions that allow us to be able to make these predictions much more accurate. And an example of that would be that very recently we published in you know, a very prestigious journal called Nature about our type 2 diabetes, uh, polygenic risk score and so on. So Imagine. there is enough data now, uh, but of course, you know, this is something that will continue to evolve and so on. So at, at this point, I wanted to ask you, Dr. Ajit, uh, you know, you have you have done this uh, genome patri, right? Um, what did you think? You know, I I know that some things come later, and some people sometimes. What were your reactions to that? It was very interesting, to be honest. Uh, you know, few of the things were bang on. You know that, um, and because you know, genome patri happened with just a swab of, you know, from the buccal cavity, so it. It wasn't that you, you know, the person who was doing, who was doing the sequencing and reading it out, matching it, was seeing me and telling about me. But you know, the, the eye color or the skin color, and um, if I'll have uh, familial male pattern pattern baldness, all of that was was quite uh, bang on. Uh, one thing was, and some things were quite funny to know because, uh, you know, being a doctor and everything, it. It, it was really nice to uh, know that, you know, I was at a, on the lower spectrum of risk of almost all the diseases, which was a good thing. But, it. <laughs> um, so I was, I was quite happy, uh, you know, seeing the things, but some of them are very funny also, you know, like the, the chances of me, uh, uh, you know, having, having a higher risk of, uh, a, a, you know, decomposing memory of sorts as I age or, or something like that. So I think those are funny things, but but I think all of that is, um, it was quite bang on. So I was very surprised because I was very skeptical about that. And, you know, even though uh, being a doctor and knowing about it, I think uh, inherently as human beings, we are not so forthcoming when it comes to knowing what the future holds, because the moment, you know, if you come to know, okay, you're susceptible to a uh, to a cancer um, or uh, diabetes or Alzheimer's or, you know, a few other things that the report says, then I think that that fear of knowing that what you could have may actually uh, put you down under and, you know, uh, may have an opposite effect, uh, which is probably the first, um, uh, you know, thought people have. But I think as a doctor, you know, I think, and, you know, we prescribe tests and we prescri prescribe uh, preventive uh, uh, plans all the time. I think it's very important to know um, what you know you could have also. You know, and now that we have certain level of accuracy uh, mm -hmm. in genetic testing, I think it's very important because in the nick of time you could uh, do something about it. So if there is a lifestyle modification, like you rightly said, um, if there is food changes, exercise that you need to do more, or I think um, even let's say if in my case, if it said that 
okay, there's a there's a little higher chance of um, Alzheimer's, let's say, you know, in that case, I could probably start doing more of mental exercise, mental health exercises, or, you know, a few other things and food changes and maybe get my, um, hopefully, by the time I turn 50, 60, or 70, there'll be more tests, which will not just be MRI and, you know, EEGs, but, you know, more predictive markers when it comes to blood markers. So I think it'll, I can just go more towards them. So I think that scare that, if you get the test done, you will find a disease is 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 wrong, and people should you know throw it out. It is actually the other way around. If you if you get a test done, if you get your genome patri, um, one it'll be very interesting to see uh, you know what's your makeup, uh, and secondly, I think it'll really help you to uh, to to prevent yourself from. Uh, falling sick faster. Aapki jo life ki race hai, aap lambe time tak. Uh, uh, yes, like, like, you know, like, if you knew you could have been a sprinter, uh, but uh, I think aap sprint karte to, hame genetic ka hai pata nahi lagta ki, ki sprint karna aap kar sakte the. So, it's, I think all of that is important. So, yeah, fair. So you know, uh, one of, I, I think I, I missed out, you had asked about the whole beauty thing as well, which yes. we look at, what did we do about that? So I think there were two things, right? Like, you know, you, you mentioned that ki some people are kuch ko dar lagta hai just to know, but I feel there are two aspects to that, right? One is, for instance, if you want to lose weight, what do you do? One, of course, you do the right things, but you also measure, right? So you are tracking and tracking the process of tracking, the process of writing down is the first thing that you would do to sort of see if you're actually doing it or not. It's the same thing. If you understand what how your body functions, the chances of you doing something about it are more likely when you are aware. And, and that's what I tell. Same thing in, let's say, running a company, doing sales or anything else. If you don't measure, you don't track, you know, it's not that you know one fine day you'll suddenly wake up and then you'll see that everything happens. It doesn't happen like that. Right? So when it comes to your own health, I think it's important to track and it's important to be able to understand what your inherent markers are. Right? With those you can't change. gift So you can't change that, right? So that is one thing that we do. But we are cognizant ki kuch logon ko pata nahi karna ki you know. I, now, one of the things that you can do, and I think people are are wanting to do, is ki, I want to look better, right? I want to stay younger. And I think that's something that I haven't found anybody who said, no, I want to look not so good. I don't want to look young. Um, and, and I'm not talking about a teenager because a teenager might want to look older, but I'm talking about, you know, most of us who after the age of, you know, let's say, 30, 40, we start to realize that, you know, this is something that, you know, you are suddenly seeing a potential end to your, you know, to your lifespan, if it is. So at that point of time, I think people want to either, you know, look better, stay younger or, or anything like that. And there itself, I feel that if people start to eat better, if people start to do the right kind of exercise, I think a lot of diseases are automatically prevented. So we said, can we build something that maybe doesn't give people information that might scare them, which is not really scary, but you know, different people have different perception. Then at least they're doing the right things in terms of their diet and nutrition and exercise. That allows them to be able to actually, you know, you know, stay actually disease-free. So I, I remember when I first recently met a lot of dermatologists because of this beauty map product. And it was interesting because two or three dermatologists told me the same thing. They said, yeah, you think of us as being somebody who you know, prescribes creams or whatever, but all your health is visible on your face, right? What you do, what you eat and all of that, 60, 70% is that. And ultimately I think, you know, when you break it all down, you know, your food, your nutrition, your exercise and all are making a big difference in your life. So we said we'll create something that allows you to, you know, find out which kind of a regimen will work for you, both in terms of diet, but also in terms of what kind of products might work for you. And uh, that allows you people to be able to look at it more as something that is not scary. It's something that helps them achieve what they want to do. 
But at the same time, I think also helps in many ways, we have better health outcomes. So I said, you know, if it is, it's okay if it's whatever motivates people, if it motivates them to make the right changes, I think we are all in a win-win. So we created beauty map, we created my fit gene and my nutri gene. And these are based on specific areas that people are excited about. So that, you know, if they don't want to know about Alzheimer's, they don't want to know about type two diabetes, it's okay. But at least if they are doing the right things, then, you know, if they find out that, let's say, you know, they are deficient in vitamin B12, for instance. Uh, and I often tell this story about my own uh, B12 discovery was um, a doctor almost was about to operate me right? and said, uh, you have carpal tunnel syndrome and for sure you've been, um, you know, you work on the computer so much, you are always there. That's the problem, right? And they're ready to operate me until I got a second opinion. I found out that I was deficient in B12. Now, of course, we should have done these, your preventive tests a few, many years ago. Uh, we didn't do those preventive tests. I, I didn't do B12, for instance. But in my genome patri, that also was very obvious, right? So if I had done that, even before, like 20 years ago, I would have known that, you know, I'm at risk for B12 and therefore I would have done a B12 test. So that is the whole purpose, right? That you can find out if you are at risk and then do those tests. Because otherwise, many people say that, yeah, TK, you know, preventive tests, you do it, you do the smallest part of what you need, right? Maybe they just do the, whatever is the cheapest Tata 1MG package, right? for instance, I'm giving an example. But if they knew that they had a risk for, let's say, breast cancer, they knew they had a risk for something else, the chances that they will make it about that test also is very high. So I, for instance, also make sure I check my HbA1c, I track it, I check uh, you know, my lipid profile, I check a lot of these other things, and I do the ones that I'm more likely to get at a two-month, three-month interval versus a one-year where I would do a, a whole checkup. Right? So I think that's the difference that we would uh, look at in terms of saying, I mean, how is it going to make a difference in, in my life? And, and I think today I'm happy to, to say that, you know, my you know, metabolic health is far better than what it was maybe even 15 years, sometimes 10, 15 years ago. So I think that's the big change you can make in your, your life. No, I think, you know, especially with reverse aging, uh, you know, the whole concept has uh, taken a new shape and light these days with uh, with uh, you know celebrate ce celebrity biologists like uh, david sinclair and you know a few others um, even the millionaire brian johnson talking about reverse aging uh, as a or talking about aging as a disease rather than a phenomenon and what they're saying is that with certain modifications and uh, changes in lifestyle and some inputs when it comes to dietary requirements, um, one could uh, potentially reverse age. And like you rightly said, you know, that uh, physically one could be one age, but metabolically or, um, uh, you know, the, the biological age of the person could be something else. So I think uh, that ways, um, uh, I think I also very strongly feel that genetic um, help, genetic testing can really help you to have an aided decision making uh, along with all the rest of the blood tests and markers and your skin turgidity and you know all the rest of the uh, medicinal uh, markers you could, you know this could really help you to have a long term view of what could really benefit like you said b12 and you know vitamin d and few others so uh, fantastic you know this is very very enlightening uh, you you mentioned all these biologists right and, and i think Today, I think some you know, someone told me recently saying that you know, unless you're you know staying living under a rock, I think everybody has heard about a lot of these, these tests. But the reality is, I think we live in our bubble and not everybody is aware of, of these tests. So maybe if I can just you know touch upon a little some of the things that are there. Um, so right now they've discovered that there are about 12 hallmarks of aging, right? And when you look at aging as a disease, you're looking at all these 12 hallmarks of aging. And there are a few things that you can do. You know, obviously we, we talked a little bit about some of the lifestyle and other things, but there are uh, some areas where you can 
Today, you can also measure what those changes are doing using genomics also. Right? Like when I when we first did genome but Patri, it was more a static information, right? Like you can do it at birth, you can do it when you are 99 or 100. That information is not changing, right? So that's a great piece of information to know. You do it once, you don't have to keep doing it. But let's say if you are saying that, you know, I've been doing all the right things. If that information is not changing, how is it helping you? Of course, you can know by using blood tests. And one of the things we are doing is we're saying, we'll take machine learning, we'll put these pieces of information together, right? What, how you're measuring your blood information and, and your genetic information and so on. And we'll give you a score so that you can say what's going on with your, with your health overall. Right? That is one part. But the second thing, and, and I think recently we, we had launched this, was the gut microbiome. And I think a lot of these, a uh, lot of people you would have heard talk a lot about gut microbiome, what is there in your gut and how, do you, how does that even help? And not very long ago, I think we had very little information about the gut microbiome. Like you could, technically you could sequence, but the information or interpretation of that was still quite far off. Right? Uh, and also what action you do take. Today, I think that is changing. So for instance, you take a sample and that unfortunately is a stool sample, not a, you can do an oral microbiome, but let's say if you take a gut, you typically take a stool sample. And then you are finding out the, what all what all bacteria are there, in what proportion they are there, what kind of fungi and all of that. And one would think that, okay, fine, all of that is there. How does that help you? But it's fascinating. It will tell you what you've actually been eating. It will tell you about things that are actually going on with your mental health and many other things. Right? And so it's an interesting way to be able to understand whatever changes you have made, can you read them? The second, which which you mentioned, I think was, you know, can you find the age, biological age versus uh, chronological age, if you will. So there are many such clocks, right? So many schools have, many universities have developed what they call as the biological clocks. And typically you are looking at certain changes in your genomes that you are studying. And those changes, or we call like a methylation or otherwise, we can then use that information to create back. So let's say if, Today you are, you know, by your date of birth, you are 50 years old. If your biological clock says you are 60, that means you have been doing something very wrong, right? I mean, that you are aging faster than normal. If your biological clock says you're 40, which means that you've been, as you mentioned, reverse aging, right? So that is what uh, we are looking at. And a lot of the millionaires and billionaires are now saying, you know, people are putting in a lot of money to understand what they can do about it. So clearly, I think you know, if we continue, if we talk, we can probably talk for another two hours on this, this subject itself. But there are many things that people are doing, like including supplements, including uh, looking at a lot of the new drugs that have come out today, whether it is like a rapamycin or a metformin or, or uh, NMNs or, or many other such things. And maybe that's that requires another whole new episode of, of Gapshap. But what are your thoughts on that in terms of uh, longevity and, and aging? So I think I, I, I'm I with the idea of, you know, genetic data supplementing all the rest of the uh, information. And I, you know, totally am uh, of the opinion that uh, aging is at a cellular level, a disease, you know, uh, there are certain triggers that uh, expedite aging or, you know, your cells are... Um, uh, you know, we call it senescence. So they are kind of uh, getting old, getting eaten up by the, you know, rest of the uh, vigilant cells, let's call them, you know, just for the sake of simplicity. Uh, but uh, so I, I also feel very strongly that if once we understand the markers, genetic markers, biomarkers, uh, blood markers, um, environmental markers, um, you know, how you were brought up in your family. I think various and, you know, different kind of markers, food that you take, exercises that you've done, uh, kind of mental pressure or societal issues that you've faced. I think all of that data put together, um, you know, with 100%, you know, genetic data contributing to majority of that percentage, um, I think will really help us to uh, to stop uh, or, or let's say slow aging. Uh, I wouldn't say, you know, I think, at us at, at a certain level the 
age cannot go beyond, I don't know, 120 is what uh, most of the scientists say, uh, that human age is supposed to be 120, but then there are conflicting views. Having said that, I think the quality of life till 100, till, you know, furthermore, can be pushed to be much nicer. You know, you could, I think one will be able to, and I'm very sure in our lifetime, we'll be able to see people living up to 100 and physically and mentally being more active and more in the present, responsive, uh, living a better quality of life. Uh, and some of the learnings anecdotally could be from, you know, a few of the islands like Japan and a few others, um, where people have been practicing certain uh, ways of life, uh, uh, values, food habits and, and whatnot. So I think I, I'm with, you know, with the idea of, um, you know, that reverse aging is not a fad movement. I think it is very much um, a reality biologically as well as uh, quite humanly possible is what I feel. And I think you you just touched upon one, you know, point of personalized medicine, right? You know, you said if rifampicin and others could be uh, personally identified with the genetic makeup of a person, if, you know, if that works for that particular person or not. And I think that's one space I, as a doctor, you know, out of inquisitiveness have been following for many years now. And um, uh, I'm very excited with the promise it holds. You know, I think right now we are going with simple, uh, let's say, uh, micro cultures or, you know, blood cultures or stool cultures where we look at bacteria and we then tell which bacteria or, you know, what is the antibiotic that could, uh, uh, you know, help with that particular bacterial infection or virological infection. Mm -hmm. uh, I think with genetic mapping uh, and, you know, with Gene Patri also, I think Medica, Medica map yes. uh, of uh, map my genome. I even I saw you know those kind of uh, information where where I could see what medicine would work for me if or what medicine has a chance of being less responsive to my uh, condition if at all I get a heart disease or a you know whatever disease. So I think uh, that's the direction the world is moving towards. Yes, I think still a little bit of cost factor and availability, accessibility is there. But I think over um, a couple of years, and I wouldn't call it, you know, five years or 10 years, but could be just two, three years, I feel uh, things will be much cheaper, much accessible. And, you know, already, um, uh, you know, I was part of a you know, discussion team uh, from from Emory University once. And, you know, we were talking about CAR T cell therapies and we were talking about, you know, like you rightly said, microbiome of a gut. We were talking of different kind of proteomics, metabolomics, um, uh, genetics, you know, all these X uh, mix, you know, the omics that, that are there. So identifying uh, even from a blood, uh, various metabolites that are, uh, present because of certain level of bacteria present in the blood or certain level of, you know, um, infection that is there or inflammation markers or in, like you said, you know, COVID, uh, we all got apprised of something called cytokine storm. So yes. cytokines are there. So I think all of those different types of cytokines or, you know, uh, uh, metabolites that are, that one can take from the blood and then put that data along with genetic data um, and then figure out what medicine would work for you, how your disease is progressing, like you rightly said. Uh, and we specifically, you know, were talking about cancer here. So we were looking at how the uh, treatment, because cancer, you know, still could be a little bit of a hit and trial with various diseases and regimes. Um, so what medicine was working for what type of cancer? And with uh, all of these omic tests put together, that it, it was almost like defining the prognosis of the treatment, not just the disease. So talking about how the disease is uh, progressing, how the treatment is progressing. And then even with latest CAR T cell therapies and whatnot, you know, taking the cells and then genetically modifying and then putting them back. And before putting them back, identifying what uh, responder will really work uh, and really benefit from a CAR T cell treatment. So I think, you know, again, it, maybe getting quite a bit technical, but the spectrum is so wide with this uh, test. And and um, it's very fascinating because yesterday only at Tata Varimji, we were, you know, we just put together something called, um, uh, you know, Ayurveda dosha assessment. And, and what we were doing was there was a set of questions of, you know, four or five minutes. And then you have 
a result that comes and then you have another four or five minutes of questions and these are all you know curated by putting ayurveda ayurvedic doctors together and the first four or five minutes of your questionnaire actually tells you your prakriti and then the next four or five minutes tells you your vikriti so so it's actually very similar to what you just said that you know you're born with a certain set of uh, code and then your environmental factors and societal factors and you know your, how you're growing up that influences the rest of it and then that's what becomes your new uh, you know sort of vikriti so i think i think we we're going you know i think fundamentals were there uh, uh, from before in our science ayurvedic science but i think now that it's getting more evidence based and scientific i think this is when we'll see more adoption so so 100% i think we'll have to cut it short and put it in perspective reverse aging will happen <laughs> Great. And I think you basically uh, summed it all really well with the with the Ayurveda thing. I think you know I find a lot of commonalities between you know ultimately genetics and genomics and and Ayurveda. Uh, it was just that at that point they didn't have that many ways of measuring things, so they looked at physical attributes and they looked at you know how you did things. But now you can, right? And I think therefore you see a lot of connections that are happening. In fact, a lot of Ayurveda doctors are also using genomics now to to uh, make those assessments, and I think you know that marriage between the old science, which has worked for thousands of years, and now the new science, I think, is where I feel innovation will will happen a lot in the coming years. Fantastic. And you mentioned about Medica Map, so maybe I will uh, tell a little story about you know what. Uh, my my husband it, it showed that you know statins won't work for him right? and um, genome patri had shown high triglycerides um, and you know ten years ago everything was fine everything looked like you know he doesn't have problems and he's very healthy he's very all of that but he was careful about triglycerides anyway um, the whole family has a history so it's more a genetic risk rather than you know necessarily a, a lifestyle related thing so doing normal things I think. His triglycerides went high when we reached close to 50. I think it, we, we couldn't really do much about it. Whatever you do, you know, you change your diet, you change exercise and all, not, nothing was happening. Then he said, okay, fine. You know, the doctor prescribed a statin. We said statin won't work. And they said, okay, try another statin. And even that statin, I think, was not, you know, uh, the medicine basically would not function the way. And he was getting pain in his uh, this thing. I think a lot of people do get, some people do get that. So he said, fine, what do you do? And so far, ultimately, I think the thing that really helped him was, you know, they started doing intermittent fasting and then one meal a day. And I think that solved that problem. So it was more a uh, thing about saying, okay, what will actually solve that problem? And, you know, if you are aware, then you are likely to take those, make those changes and you'll be more motivated. And when you see that happening and you see that everything is getting back to normal, I think that excitement about, you know, using this science becomes all the more fascinating. So I think that's what we are hoping people can do. That they can use information and use it to their advantage, right? Use it in a way that, you know, that you don't think that genetics is your destiny, even though it is what you are born with. And like you see in Ayurveda that, you know, things change. I think it's the same thing. What you do with your body and, and your environment, I think ultimately determines the course of, you know, how your health span is going to be, how your lifespan is going to be. And, and how you can live a more healthier life. And maybe we'll all pop one day, but at least, you know, when you do, you are not, you know, bothering people and you're not making the others around you also dependent, right? And I think for me, that would be a very important thing, right? When I ultimately do, I want to be happy, you know, maybe who knows what happens with, at least while I'm living, I'm I'm living a happy life and, and healthy life. So that's that's more important to me than saying I lived up to 120, for instance. Oh my God, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> this I think one important point. So I think we discussed about you know a few things and especially knowing about your genetic makeup and you know few um, raw data information that you know comes from your mapping as well as you know a few other things put together um i think um in my opinion and you practice it at map my genome um after you get the result um counseling will really help 
uh, from an adoption point of view. Uh, and it helps, you know, uh, in present also, um, because I think it alleviates the fear from people and they understand what this really means because the interpretation and the perspectives may mar the exact, um, you know, information that one wants to, uh, you know, pass on. But I think um, with, with counseling, genetic counseling um, and counselors, which are very few in the country, I feel, um, um, I think it can really um, alleviate the fear in the minds of the people that, uh, okay, genetic uh, um, mapping or, you know, getting to do more of tests is actually bad because it may surface some disease. Um, when on the other hand, it's actually making you aware of something that may happen, you know, which you can actually uh, prevent in the nick of time. So what do you, what do you think? How do you, you know, how does counselors, uh, uh, how do counselors pay and uh, play an important role at, at Map My Genome? So um, I think you've got the absolutely the right piece of what happens with you know consumers when they first get that in that report, and clearly most of us will have something that you are at higher risk for or not. So you know, while in the past I think most counselors were focused around a genetic disorder, which basically means that you have the disease or a baby is likely to get it or so on. When we started using our genetic counselors to explain the overall risk for a, from a preventive point of view, I think we realized that that was a very important time. It was a, also sometimes the first time they were talking to somebody in that level of detail on what, how is it going to influence your health, right? And uh, I believe that genetic counseling, whether it is for a genetic disorder or for prevention, I think is the cornerstone of what you can do with geno genomic information because ultimately, you know, whether we like it or not, humans want somebody to tell them about, you know, how they can actually make those changes. I think it alleviates the pain of seeing a risk because it's not a, it's not a diagnosis. And when you first see it, maybe, you know, unless someone explains that to you, maybe you will have doubts about it. So it, it's important that they, they help explain what this, what this risk means and, and what can you do about it. Right? So I think, uh, getting information is not enough. I think you have to make some actions. And I think having that genetic counselor makes that connection between you taking that action and, and you getting that information. So I think they are the most important, uh, you know, uh, they're most important in getting people to actually make those changes. They are also very important to talk to doctors, right? For instance, when uh, a doctor prescribes certain tests, uh, genetics like uh, exome sequencing or anything else, Many times, I think doctors have not been taught this in, in their uh, medicine. I'm sure, I don't know if you, you uh, learned a lot of medicine, like during medicine, whether a lot of genetics was taught. In fact, probably it wasn't even there in textbooks and, and that knowledge wasn't even available because this whole genetic mapping started in 2000, 2001. And now we have, we have sort of closed, you know, hopefully closed the chapter on this, the base level sequencing for, for a lot of people. But like you mentioned, I think some population, we still need to do a lot of work. So I think genetic counselors are also extremely important to be able to talk to the doctors, help them explain what the result means. Right? So let's say if you find uh, what we call as a pathogenic variant, right? something that will dis induce disease or, or, or uh, cause disease, I think it's important to also say tell you know, medical practitioners what that means from a genetic point of view and also what they can do about it. So, so genetic counselors are playing an important role in talking to, doc to families and, and talking to patients, but also talking to medical professionals and explaining what a result means and how they can change their treatment protocols or their discussion with their diagnos diagnosis based on this information. So I think they are, in my view, very, very important from both these, uh, both these angles and we have, always made sure that you know with every genetic test there is a counseling that is uh, that goes with it nice so i think maybe a few of the last questions or my thoughts you know i think and also would love to know your thoughts on these you know in terms of biggest challenges uh, you know to close especially in india uh, right uh, so what are the biggest challenges that you're seeing when it comes to adoption of genetic mapping gene testing uh, in the minds of consumers, 
एंड ऑल्सो बिकॉज यू नो अल्टीमेटली वन ऑफ द सेंटर पीस इन द हेल्थ केयर इको सिस्टम इज डॉक्टर और राधा द सेंटर पीस आई वुड से सो हाउ इज इट यू नो how is it going when it comes to breaking the ice with the doctors let's say when it comes to genetic testing because like you rightly said you know we were taught um, medicine in a certain way yes you know very aware of the biochemical uh, the biochemistry and physiology and genetics and but i think the application of that when it comes to reading of atcg and all of that i think is wasn't you know it was only taught okay three make a codon and you know how 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 few of them are ter- terminating stop and start codons and few other things right and then this could be this this could be that uh, amino acid so i think it was very um, very um, uh, at a very cellular or a genetic level understanding but the application was not really taught makes it easy for doctors to understand but definitely not there uh, so how do you see you know uh, because i how i would feel is that one i think cost is a still a kind of a challenge because the the benefits are not immediate uh, plus there is certain level of uh, let's say risk percentage rather than a confirmation of a glucose or uh, you know in the blood um, so i think that's one two i think from access point of view or awareness point of view also people are not so much there yet and uh, from a doctor's point of view i think again doctors also are trained to be curative and therapeutic in their approach um, so so i think that's where the whole preventive and wellness angle uh, to an extent uh, is not hardwired into doctors minds and they think of it more from you know okay patient has come ab isko theek karna hai uh, and of course when the patient comes and they tell about what they should actually be doing not doing uh, for the future but i think it starts from getting into a disease uh, uh, you know the doctor journey so i would so how would you are you do you have the same thoughts or any more or and you know please so so it's interesting i mean the cost has come down quite a lot right i mean i think today i think when i look at medica map which is basically we're looking at 165 drugs um and the cost is like 7000 rupees so you're basically paying 42 rupees a drug for your lifetime right? so it's not you know in my view is not a lot of money you're paying i think people pay more for one order of let's say swiggy or 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 zomato right like you order a food this thing and you're doing it once uh, i think it is worthwhile because it ultimately is like you know giving you information for a lifetime but i agree i think it's something that people think it is nobody is forcing them to do it right so for instance when the government mandated covid tests i think everybody did it and everyone saw the value of it right? so i think one is that there is still not enough Uh, awareness, but the cost wise, it has come down quite a lot, right? So most tests, at least that we are priced at, are around seven thousand, eight thousand rupees, which is I think comparable to a lot of like an executive health checkup. But you're doing it once in a lifetime versus not. The other thing that you mentioned about affordability, uh, accessibility, right? Like so, I think one of that's another thing that we did. We said you know it is harder to get people to actually draw your blood, even though in India I think it is. way way better i think you know companies like tata van mg and others have made it much more easier to be able to get that for everyone but we did it with you know you can even just take a saliva sample and do it right so you don't even need a a person to come to your house or anything like that you can just get it shipped so as long as you know e-commerce is doing well i think you know for us to reach particular places are is not a problem so i think that has also made it a lot easier for us like as e-commerce has developed over the years i think it has also allowed us to be able to uh, get more become much more accessible but i think ek jagah ja you know we are not doing a good job is creating content in languages where people can can actually understand what we are doing right when people understand they definitely come right it is it is about that so I think ये हमारी गलती है कि हमने हिंदी में ज्यादा we didn't make much videos right or or in 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 other languages like Telugu or or many more and so even though I can speak a lot of languages I think I need we all need to uh, create more education around that and uh, doctors के साथ तो I think it is getting a lot better right I think today an average um, doctor is aware of genetic testing. 10 years ago that was not the case uh, so 10 years ago the kind of calls we used to get 
were about paternity testing, maternity testing, and maybe about thalassemia, uh, cystic fibrosis, and some of the more single gene disorders. So it was on their own. I think now we are seeing that that is changing. Right? Uh, we are seeing a widespread adoption in oncologists, in gynecologists, in neurologists that have started using genetic testing as a means for diagnosis. Right? So diagnosis becomes easier. Treatment becomes easier. Preventive part, I think we still have a little bit more. We see a lot more happening directly from consumers than from doctors, but that is also changing. So I think those are the changes that have happened in the last 10 years. But I think the next three, four years, we'll see a much more wider adoption. I think there are many more uh, people who are aware of genetics. There are, uh, you know, and I think that is having a cascading effect. So hope, I'm hopeful that, you know, at least I've seen it from 10 years ago to now. Uh, that the biggest acceleration happened over the last three, four years, and especially post-COVID. So I'm confident that, you know, we will see this uh, happening. But one place where maybe it would help a lot more would be if insurance covered these tests. Right? Uh, and that would allow us to have a more widespread adoption of some of these tests, at least for things like, you know, if we can create, let's say, everybody can be covered for Medicamap. I think it will save a lot of lives because you know, a lot of hospital deaths happen because of wrong medicines. And it's not that the doctor gave the wrong medicine, it's just that the medicine didn't work for that patient. So I think those are the things that I feel are, you know, they are win-win for everybody, whether it is uh, a doctor, whether it's a hospital or insurance company, as well as consumers. But I think we are yet to see that coming to a large enough scale yet. Fantastic. Sorry, Good. disturbing. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you. Yeah. I think uh, that would, you know, that's a that's a very succinct, uh, you know, way of saying why is it important. And I think it's it's uh, very very clear. I think I'm I'm very happy to learn so much about genetic mapping today in an hour than I probably you know kept on reading books on and 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 talking to friends and family. Um, but uh, thank you, thank you for your for your time. Um, it was really, really nice chatting with you and conversing with you. Absolutely, it was an absolute uh, pleasure uh, talking to you. And I know that we can continue talking for more, uh, more than you know, at least a few more hours on this topics. But uh, but I do understand that you know we've we've gone over an hour, and uh, that's usually. You know, that's when people will lose their attention. I think we can continue talking. So maybe we'll leave it for another time and another day where we can have more, more discussion and see where it has progressed. Uh, maybe discuss more about all the newer things like you were talking about, you know, party therapies or, or others that are you know, interconnected with, with a lot of what we are doing and others. So thank you so much. But before we close, can I ask you a couple of quick questions and not related to genetics? Sure, please. Okay. So uh, what is prevention according to you? Prevention is uh, knowing um, about yourself, about your genetic makeup, about your, uh, you know, your biological makeup uh, in advance. Uh, and so you could take an action uh, to prevent yourself from falling sick in the future. So do things now. And what do you do to uh, to look so young? <laughs> oh really <laughs> okay uh well i eat a lot of vitamin c based uh, uh uh fruits i think i think I, it's all about food i feel uh, and maybe a little bit of good genes uh from the parents i think so you're uh you you that's the best blessing you can get i think you get the right genes but also about all the food that you eat uh any favorite book or movie Favorite book on or movie? Uh, ah, book would be, you know, we are talking about um, genes. So I think Gene by Siddharth Mukherjee was one of the very captivating books. And it kind of brought back all the memories of medicine. Uh, and, uh, and you know, everything that we had read, even from actually not just medicine, but even 11th and 12th, where you read about a lot of scientists and, you know, the, the, the th different theories in biology. So Gene would be one book that I would totally read again. And you said movie, is it? Yeah, movie if you can, if there is something that you can. Um, that's a tough one. So many. <laughs> I can't, can't, can't name one. Movie buff. 